Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And I'm, I'm pleased to have occasion to address the government's uh, financial and economic response to the pandemic, um, as we're doing in the debate on Bill C-14. Obviously, the pandemic was something that uh, caught the world by surprise, uh, not just uh, folks here in Canada following up on the 2019 uh, election. And what became very clear very quickly was that without an appropriate public health response, the medical systems of uh, places across the world were overwhelmed. And there were people who were dying because they couldn't get access to care because there were simply too many people who needed that care all at the same time. And what that meant was that in order to prevent the rapid spread of the coronavirus and to keep people safe, there had to be a, a serious reduction in economic activity because people largely had to stay home, Madam Speaker. And so that has been responsible for enormous costs, not just here in Canada, but in fact, across the world. And governments across the world are facing uh, the similar kinds of financial stress that the government here in Canada and the provincial governments across the country, regardless of political stripe, are, are also facing. So we have governments across the country. We have an NDP government in uh, BC. We have conservative and liberal governments right across the country. And all of them are facing significant uh, financial uh, strife, just as so many governments across the world are, because that's the nature of the situation that, that we're in. So the question then is, how are we going to deal with this? And it's been very interesting to listen to the debate here today. I have to say, I am having trouble squaring some of the claims made by conservative colleagues who, on the one hand, are very quick to want to point out that the pandemic relief measures, whether it's the Canada uh, emergency wage subsidy or the uh, ca the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, now the Canada Recovery B Benefit, a number of the programs that were brought in in order to help Canadians cope with the uh, financial stresses of public health measures were things that passed with unanimous consent, which means that the Conservatives also supported those uh, measures. So they're very quick to want to say, that they were there, that they supported those measures, that they endorsed that spending. And then on the other hand, uh, wanting to have their cake and eat it too, they want to uh, say that, uh, you know, all of this spending has to be curtailed, but that they should get credit for the spending when it's happening. And it's a little bit um, of an incoherent message, uh, frankly, Madam, Madam, Madam Speaker. And so I'm, I'm at a bit of a loss as to how to explain it. I don't think it's been adequately explained. What I do know is that if you take them at their word on wanting to roll back the pandemic support spending, even as, which seems to be a pretty clear implication of their attacks on, uh, on spending in the uh, pandemic, that even as conservative members stand up, even just today earlier in question period, there were questions about access to various kinds of EI benefits that are part of the spending package that they're uh, apparently opposed to, even though they support. And you can start to get a sense for that incoherence that I'm trying to get at, Madam Speaker, as I, as I bounce around. I'm just trying to capture what I've heard of the conservative position here um, today and so but the so the so the question that that we that we face as a country that we faced at the beginning of the pandemic but that we still face is whether so long as we continue to need these kinds of public health measures in place and there's a corresponding reduction in economic activity whether that cost which has to be borne one way or another can either be borne on the public books or it can be borne uh, privately. Who pays for that? And what we're seeing is a decision, and I, you know, this is the kind of decision that the NDP tends to support and that we certainly supported through this pandemic. It's, it's the right approach. We don't agree with the Liberals in all of the details, but the idea that the, that the debt that has been caused by the drastic effects on the economy ought to be borne collectively by Canadians together through their government, rather than be put haphazardly on the backs of individual uh, Canadians who will be affected differently depending on whether they were already financially vulnerable prior to the pandemic, like many of our seniors, people living with disabilities, 
and uh, others, students, for instance, Madam Speaker, whether because they were already vulnerable, they should be in a, in a position uh, where uh, w where they have to bear that privately and can't, and end up in in uh, default or homeless or worse. That's that's one scenario. That scenario also includes Canadians who, just by virtue of the industry that they happen to work work in, they may have had very successful. Uh, careers and, and were able to provide for their families, but because they happened to work in one industry that was severely affected by the pandemic as opposed to another, that they then might incur those serious costs and find themselves without a home. That's one way that it could have been dealt with. That's what it looks like if you don't have a, a serious and significant public spending uh, package. Or the other way to do it was to say that this isn't anybody's fault. No one deserves to be ruined by the pandemic. And in fact, I think in a moment of pandemic that showed how connected we, are, we actually all are and how interdependent we are and how much we do already rely on each other, despite uh, the kind of fictions of radical individualism that drive certain ways of thinking about the economy. The fact is, is that we do all rely on each other. And I think the pandemic has really showed that. And so the other, uh, the other way to respond to this pandemic that I'm glad Canada largely chose uh, was to say we need to bear the costs of this together and make sure that Canadians aren't left out in the cold just by virtue of the industry that they happen to, to work in or their financial position prior to the uh, pandemic. So we need to think deeply about how it is that we are going to yeah, pay for this pay for this big bill, not just as a result of what's been spent already in the pandemic, but the very real cost that we are going to have to continue to incur as governments across the world will also have to continue to incur uh, in order to get us to a full economic recovery. There's that question. And, and I think what I want to highlight here is the fact that whether we chose that collective model or not, the cost to the economy was there. It's a question of who's going to bear it. And as we move forward, the other thing that doesn't show, so that cost, those the, the economic effects and the cost of all those private bankruptcies and people losing their home and all of the things that would have happened had there not been a meaningful uh, public response financially don't show up on the ledger. So it's hard to quantify what didn't happen just as it can be hard to quantify, although many people have done a lot of work over the years to quantify what the cost of homelessness is, what the cost of poverty is for people who end up, because they don't have a home, end up in emergency rooms and end up struggling with addiction and end up uh, in overrepresented in the uh, justice system and having many more interactions than people normally would because because they're poor and they don't have the resources that uh, many other Canadians enjoy. Those things all have a price tag as well, Madam Speaker. So they're harder to quantify, but uh, researchers over the years, I think, have done a good job of showing that in the long term, when you invest in people, you can save money. And so we stand at this moment where we were forced into massive public expenditure by the circumstances and where I think there was a will and a sense of solidarity that enabled that kind of expenditure. And we're going to need more of it going forward. And I think this is a moment for Canadians to realize the extent to which we can actually save money in the long term if we make the right investments now and if we continue to make those investments on an ongoing basis. So there is the question, how do you pay for these things? Well, you know, Madam Speaker, I have to tell you, I look at where the country has been and where it's been going over the last 20 or 30 years. This isn't new to the pandemic. Uh, for as much as uh, conservatives want to rail against the prevailing tax rate, the fact of the matter is, is that the corporate tax rate has gone from 28% in the year 2000 to just 15% today. And one of the huge emerging industries over that time period has been on the internet. It's been in the digital economy. It's been Facebook. It's been Netflix. It's been Amazon. Some of the economic monsters that didn't exist 20 years ago, frankly, don't pay any meaningful taxes here in Canada. So the idea that the wealth doesn't exist in order to be able to make these prudent investments to recognize the, the dignity of humanity and to allow people to live a decent life with a roof over their head 
and enough money in their pocket to be able to go to the grocery, the, the local grocery store and fill their fridge, Madam Speaker, that, that wealth is there. And Canadian taxpayers, I, I don't, you know, I, Canadian citizens, I think is a better word, frankly, Madam Speaker, um, would be saving more money in the long term because we'd be spending less on some of the mainline budget items. What are some of the huge budget lines in, uh, you know, whether it's the federal government or more particularly provincial governments where the, where the real cost of not making these investments is born? What are some of the biggest items? It's health and justice, Madam Speaker. Those are some of the biggest items. So we have an opportunity here to do more. At the federal level, something that we don't see in this economic update, we're missing an opportunity again. We just had a vote on the legislation that could create a framework for pharmacare in Canada. That's an opportunity to save money. It's gonna be more money on the federal ledger, yes, but overall, we know from many studies conducted now that Canadians are paying more for their prescription drugs than it would cost to have a national pharmacare plan. We know that from the commission that the government just had. We know that from the parliamentary budget officer. We know that from a report that was published in the uh, Canadian uh, Medical Journal back in 2014, I think it was, Madam Speaker. We know this all over the place. And, and, and it's no coincidence that Canada doesn't have a national pharmacare plan and we pay among the highest rates. So this is another example where an upfront investment and a rearrangement of the way that we pay for things between governments could actually issue in real savings. We know that the sticker price of a guaranteed annual income appears high, but we also know that we already do this in many ways. We do it with a guaranteed income supplement for seniors. It's not good enough. Too many of our seniors who depend on the GIS are living in poverty. They're legislated into poverty by the GIS rate that this house and, this, and the government accountable to it set. But we already do a fair bit of that. We do that through the, uh, through the universal child benefit. We have many ways in which we are already supplementing the income of many Canadians. The marginal cost of getting there is something that could be bearable if we could have a real conversation about how much the wealthy pay. I mean, the wealthiest in Canada have already increased their wealth by $37 billion during the pandemic, Madam Speaker. It's just ridiculous to say that the money isn't out there and that these aren't things that we can do. And there's a lot of opportunity when we talk about investment that we make in recovery to help create jobs and to create jobs in a new lower carbon economy that actually helps Canada meet its climate change commitments uh, and to try and avert a climate catastrophe, which is also going to be very expensive. So, you know, we hear a lot from the Conservatives about you know, uh, how they think they're, the, they're these great uh, fiscal managers, but the policy ideas that they're presenting to respond to the pandemic are either that of the Liberals, because they say, hey, we supported all this stuff, so give us the credit, or they don't want to do it. And it's just, I think they need to come just kind of be honest about what it is, what tree they're actually barking up, Madam Speaker. Is it the get rid of these programs in order to balance the books immediately tree? Or is it something else? Uh, and, and what are the kinds of supports that they want to provide that this, that, uh, that uh, like put the ideas on the table, Madam Speaker. The NEP's got lots of ideas about what we can do. We hear a lot of the negativity from the conservatives, but we don't actually hear a lot of the positive proposals for what they would do differently. Here in Manitoba, I have to say, I was astounded when the provincial budget came out this week and the conservatives here in Manitoba chose to cut property taxes to accelerate the timeline on which they were reducing property taxes as if that was gonna help anybody with the pandemic, there again, they're screaming about how much debt and deficit there is. They're asking the federal government for more money, although they're not flowing that money out to people during the pandemic, which is partly why I think their popularity here in Manitoba has tanked. They've been doing a bad job. And what they come up with is to further reduce revenue in a way that's designed to help the people that already uh, have more money and more resources than others. It's a completely bogus way to try and respond to a pandemic. Now that's not to say that everything has been right here in this house in Ottawa. I mean, I think one of the real frustrations for New Democrats on the part of the NDP, if you look at 
is that they <laughs> is that yeah they're they're willing to do spending but they don't put the kinds of checks and balances in place that need to be there because they're not willing to take on the wealthy and the well connected so that's not just about what the tax rate is it's also about the details for program spending. So when you look at something like the Canadian emergency wage subsidy, Madam Speaker, what we saw very clearly was, first of all, they were proposing just a 10% wage subsidy, which really wasn't going to be enough. It was enough. It was a bad enough idea that it precipitated a joint letter between the labor movement, the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and the NDP, call, which is not something you see every day, Madam Speaker, uh, calling for a 75% wage subsidy. And when we got there, one of the things that New Democrats were, were quick to say was that we needed to have rules in place right away to make sure that companies that ended up doing well overall in the first year of the pandemic weren't able to keep their wage subsidy uh, money. Or, and certainly that they weren't able to pay dividends to their shareholders and bonuses to their CEOs based on profits if they were receiving money under the, uh, under the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. This was something that many other jurisdictions did when they brought in a similar programs in their own countries. It was a really key component of getting the wage subsidy right, and that was where the Liberals uh, failed to get it right because it involves standing up to some of the more powerful people in the country. I'm not talking about people who are powerful in the democratic sphere, but people who are powerful in the economy. We saw that again with the We Charity fiasco, where instead of running uh, more money through a successful student employment program that goes back decades, I'm talking about the Canada Summer Jobs Program here, they decided it would be better to invent a whole new, a whole new program. It just so happens with uh, buddies of the government uh, and particularly an organization that the daughter of the finance minister was working for. Um, and so, you know, I mean, these are the kinds of things where, you know, liberals end up giving a lot of good public spending or spending that could be good and could be in the public interest a really bad name because they mismanage it because the culture of entitlement endemic in the liberal party and in the liberal governments gets in the way of good implementation which is quite uh, frustrating. And, and so we do need to have a conversation in Canada. It's one that the NEP has been trying to lead about how the wealthy pay their fair share after decades of tax cuts. Don't kid yourself. Taxes have not been going up on the wealthiest Canadians and on the biggest corporations. They've been going down significantly. They still have options to shunt their earnings out of Canada into tax havens located across the world so that they're not paying their fair share. That's something that we ought to have seen action from the government on by now, but we haven't. So there are ways to pay for these things and there are real savings to be accrued if you make these investments. And if you don't make these investments in the context of a pandemic, Madam Speaker, then those costs weren't gonna disappear. They were just gonna be put on the shoulders of individual Canadians already struggling to figure out how to how to live their lives in this new and unsettling and challenging context who would then have even more to worry about when it came to paying their rent or paying their mortgage so that wasn't the right approach we needed to support people and we're going to need to support people a lot more that's not government supporting people with some father knows best attitude that's people electing representatives to work on the things that they want, like more accessible prescription drugs, more affordable prescription drugs. So they elect people that they trust to set up a system that can deliver that appropriately, like making sure that we're not paying for homelessness through emergency rooms and through the justice system, but that we're doing it upfront by investing in housing and putting roofs over people's heads and allowing them to live a decent life, despite the fact um, that they may not have a lot of personal wealth. Those are the things that we're talking about. It is a really important uh, debate. It's not, a, you know, I wish we could have uh, had this debate without having a pandemic uh, force it upon us. Um, but these are some of the things I hope Canadians are keeping in mind as they listen to the debate at home. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Humber River uh, Black Creek. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and to my honourable colleague, congratulations on a, on a fantastic speech that talks about all of the good things that we've done, but also the challenges that 
all of us uh, as a country are going to be facing in the future. In particular, I wanted to ask you about the pharmacare, uh, something that we as Liberals care very much about. But the challenges that face us all, and uh, I know my colleague supports that as well, but I'd like to hear suggestions from him on how we can move that agenda along, given the fact that it's something that's going to require the provinces and the territories um, uh, to work with us. And uh, what are his suggestions to try to move that agenda along on farming? The Honourable Member for Elma Transcona. Well, I thank the member very much for her question. Indeed, she may well have been a member um, when the uh, Liberals first committed to this and ran on it in 1997. And I think she may well have been a member ever since. And so, uh, you know, I, I certainly think that in that time, uh, Liberals ought to have come up with some, some of their own good ideas on how to advance this agenda much further than it has already. For me, I think if the federal government signals a willingness to put that money on the table and, and re requests a meeting with the premiers, that, that would be a good start. Uh, and, you know, moving forward a legislative framework for that when we have examples already in the, in the uh, Canada Health Act or non-legislatively in the, in the Canada Health Accords. There are a lot of models for interprovincial and federal cooperation on important issues of health. Uh, typically, it's been when the federal government has signaled a, a willingness to actually spend the money that uh, provinces come to the table. So we're waiting on the government for that. Questions et commentaires, l'honorable député de Rivière. The honorable member for Rivière des Mille-Îles. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, I wanted to say that our, uh, the conservative speech uh, previously is not uh, one that uh, I think anyone in this House supports. Now, my question is this. I know that paid sick leave and uh, pharmacare are very important to the NDP. You talked about it uh, last weekend uh, at your convention. This is really a fundamental pillar of uh, your party, and we, we respect that. My question is this. If the Liberal Party wanted to impose national standards for long-term care homes, what would your position be? And uh, the member should be addressing his comments through the chair and not directly to the member. The Honourable Member for Elmwood, Transcona. Désolé, mais je n'ai pas... I'm sorry, but I didn't hear, uh, I wasn't listening to the uh, interpretation, and so I didn't uh, understand the acronym that you used. So perhaps I should ask for a, a clarification from my colleague, if that's possible, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, uh, we'll just have to keep it brief because uh, we don't have a lot of time for other questions. The Honourable Member, uh, if he wants to clarify. Yes, of course. Uh, so the acronym I used refers to the long-term care homes, uh, people who work with our seniors. The Liberal government clearly has the intention to impose national standards for these seniors' residences, even though it is entirely a provincial jurisdiction. Very good. Okay, the member can uh, respond. Transcona, a brief answer, please. Sure. I mean, we would like to see the federal government work with the provinces to establish national standards. That's 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 certain. But it's something that has to where that collaboration has to be there. There has to be a table where the provinces are working with the federal government to determine what those standards are. And I believe that Canadian provinces should be able to come to the table and uh, land on uh, minimum standards that anyone could expect to uh, have their care observe wherever they live in the country, whether it, whether it's in Quebec or elsewhere. Questions and comments? The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I, I had the opportunity last week to connect with Lexi Buchanan and other volunteers with the Disability for Tax Fairness Alliance, and they identified all the ways in which the disability tax credit leaves out so many disabled Canadians by definition of the disability tax credit. So when, through you, Madam Chair, to our critic for disability justice, when this government puts a paltry $600 out during this pandemic, would he care to comment about what it would mean for Canadians across the country for his proposal of a guaranteed basic livable income of $2,200 for people living with disabilities? The Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona. 
Well, thank you very much for that question. And when we talk about kind of hidden costs, the hidden cost of not investing in people. I mean, I think one of the things that it's important to know is that there's all sorts of people who are trying to access the disability tax credit. The rules are convoluted, sometimes changing without changing on paper, they change in their interpretation. Those things can be very hard to access and they benefit predominantly the people who already uh, have the most income because they're the ones who pay the most uh, taxes within the disability community. Policing all of that, has a bureaucratic uh, cost that could be spent actually supporting people living with disabilities, not legislating them into poverty with the kind of rates that we see with provincial disability uh, programs and federal ones across the country. And that relief from financial stress uh, would also allow us to unlock the potential of people living with disabilities in uh, Canada who have a lot to offer, but many of whom spend most of their day uh, struggling with the challenges of uh, poverty instead of being able to contribute their time and talent to, uh, to uh, other things. And comments, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Government House Leader. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm wondering if the member could just kind of elaborate on an impression that often New Democrats would leave, and that is that we have these uh, billionaires running all over the country. Uh, I don't know how many there is, but it seems to be a lot according to the New Democrats in terms of numbers. When you talk about uh, a, a, a wealth tax, what percentage would be on individuals versus corporations. Often corporations are, are owned in part by uh, large pension plans, uh, uh, union organizations, and, and, and so forth. And if you just provide some sort of a comment in regards to, is he talking about that group of people too? The our member for Elmo Transcona. And the wealth tax that we propo uh, we've proposed is on fortunes over $20 million. So, I mean, that doesn't affect a lot of people in my riding. I don't think it affects a lot of people in the riding of Winnipeg North, but it does actually affect a lot of folks at the top who have been getting a pretty good ride for the last 20, 30 years, seeing their, seeing their tax rates go down. And so uh, we, we're talking about going after uh, a smaller number of people within Canada to have them pay a proportionately larger share of the overall tab in ways that frankly uh, they used to. It's not like this is unprecedented. And in fact, the kinds of rates of taxation that even the NEP is proposing today is less than what it was in the immediate post-war uh, period. And uh, so, so that's, that's, that's your answer.